Proto-Germanic abbreviated PGMC, also called Common Germanic is the reconstructed proto-language of the Germanic branch of the Indo-European languages. Proto-Germanic developed from pre-Proto-Germanic into three branches during the first half of the first millennium of the Common Era, West Germanic, East Germanic and North Germanic, which however remained in contact over a considerable time, especially the Ingvianic languages including English, which arose from West Germanic dialects and remained in continued contact with North Germanic. A defining feature of Proto-Germanic is the completion of Grimm's Law, a set of sound changes that occurred between its status as a dialect of Proto-Indo-European and its gradual divergence into a separate language. As it is probable that the development of this sound shift spanned a considerable time several centuries, Proto-Germanic cannot adequately be reconstructed as a simple node in a tree model but rather represents a phase of development that may span close to a thousand years. The end of the Common Germanic period is reached with the beginning of the Migration period in the 4th century. The alternative term, Germanic parent language, may be used to include a larger scope of linguistic developments, spanning the Nordic Bronze Age and Pre-Roman Iron Age in Northern Europe 2nd to 1st millennia BC to include Pre-Germanic, Preg-MC, Early Proto-Germanic, EPGMC, and Late Proto-Germanic. LPGMC. While Proto-Germanic refers only to the most recent reconstruction of the common ancestor of Germanic languages, the Germanic parent language refers to the entire journey that the dialect of Proto-Indo-European that would become Proto-Germanic underwent through the millennia. The Proto-Germanic language is not directly attested by any coherent surviving texts, it has been reconstructed using the comparative method. Fragmentary direct attestation exists of late Common Germanic in early runic inscriptions specifically the 2nd century AD Vimos inscriptions and the 2nd century BC Negau helmet inscription, and in Roman Empire era transcriptions of individual words notably in Tacitus's Germania, c. 90 CE. <laughs> Archaeology and early historiography The Proto-Germanic language developed in southern Scandinavia Denmark, South Sweden and southern Norway, the Urheimat original home of the Germanic tribes. It is possible that Indo-European speakers first arrived in southern Scandinavia with the Corded Ware culture in the mid-3rd millennium BC, developing into the Nordic Bronze Age cultures by the early 2nd millennium BC. Proto-Germanic developed out of pre-Proto-Germanic during the pre-Roman Iron Age of northern Europe. According to the Germanic substrate hypothesis, it may be influenced by non-Indo-European cultures, such as the Funnelbeaker culture, but the sound change in the Germanic languages known as Grimm's Law points to a non-substratic development away from other branches of Indo-European. Proto-Germanic itself was likely spoken after c. 500 BC, and Proto-Norse from the 2nd century AD and later is still quite close to reconstructed Proto-Germanic, but other common innovations separating Germanic from Proto-Indo-European suggest a common history of pre-Proto-Germanic speakers throughout the Nordic Bronze Age. Early Germanic expansion in the pre-Roman Iron Age 5th to 1st centuries BC placed Proto-Germanic speakers in contact with the continental Celtic Latine horizon. A number of Celtic loanwords in Proto-Germanic have been identified. By the 1st century AD, Germanic expansion reached the Danube and the Upper Rhine in the south and the Germanic peoples first entered the historical record. At about the same time, extending east of the Vistula Oxywi culture, Przeworsk culture, Germanic speakers came into contact with early Slavic cultures, as reflected in early Germanic loans in Proto-Slavic. By the 3rd century, LPGMC speakers had expanded over significant distance, from the Rhine to the Dniepr spanning about 1,200 km 700 miles. The period marks the breakup of late Proto-Germanic and the beginning of the historiographically recorded Germanic migrations. The first coherent text recorded in a Germanic language is the Gothic Bible, written in the later 4th century in the language of the Thirvingi Gothic Christians, who had escaped persecution by moving from Scythia to Mosia in 348. The earliest available coherent texts conveying complete sentences, including verbs in Proto-Norse begin in c. 400 in runic inscriptions such as the Tune runestone. The delineation of late common Germanic from Proto-Norse at about that time is largely a matter of convention. 
Early West Germanic text is available from the 5th century, beginning with the Frankish Bergacker inscription. Evolution The evolution of Proto-Germanic from its ancestral forms, beginning with its ancestor Proto-Indo-European, began with the development of a separate common way of speech among some geographically nearby speakers of a prior language and ended with the dispersion of the Proto-language speakers into distinct populations with mostly independent speech habits. Between the two points, many sound changes occurred. Theories of phylogeny Solutions Phylogeny as applied to historical linguistics involves the evolutionary descent of languages. The phylogeny problem is the question of what specific tree, in the tree model of language evolution, best explains the paths of descent of all the members of a language family from a common language, or proto-language at the root of the tree to the attested languages at the leaves of the tree. The Germanic languages form a tree with Proto-Germanic at its root that is a branch of the Indo-European tree, which in turn has Proto-Indo-European at its root. Borrowing of lexical items from contact languages makes the relative position of the Germanic branch within Indo-European less clear than the positions of the other branches of Indo-European. In the course of the development of historical linguistics, various solutions have been proposed, none certain and all debatable. In the evolutionary history of a language family, philologists consider a genetic tree model appropriate only if communities do not remain in effective contact as their languages diverge. Early Indo-European had limited contact between distinct lineages, and, uniquely, the Germanic subfamily exhibited a less tree-like behavior, as some of its characteristics were acquired from neighbors early in its evolution rather than from its direct ancestors. The internal diversification of West Germanic developed in an especially non-tree-like manner. Proto-Germanic is generally agreed to have begun about 500 BC. Its hypothetical ancestor between the end of Proto-Indo-European and 500 BC is termed pre-Proto-Germanic. Whether it is to be included under a wider meaning of Proto-Germanic is a matter of usage. Winfred P. Lehman regarded Jacob Grimm's first Germanic sound shift or Grimm's Law, and Werner's Law, which pertained mainly to consonants and were considered for many decades to have generated Proto-Germanic as pre-Proto-Germanic and held that the upper boundary was the fixing of the accent, or stress, on the root syllable of a word, typically on the first syllable. Proto-Indo-European had featured a movable pitch accent comprising an alternation of high and low tones, as well as stress of position determined by a set of rules based on the lengths of a word's syllables. The fixation of the stress led to sound changes in unstressed syllables. For Lehman, the lower boundary was the dropping of final a or e in unstressed syllables, for example, post pi asterisk void e greater than gothic weight, nose. Intonson agreed with Lehman about the upper boundary but later found runic evidence that the a was not dropped. Equacross, Raitha, I, Wakras, wrote this. He says, we must therefore search for a new lower boundary for Proto-Germanic. Antonsen's own scheme divides Proto-Germanic into an early stage and a late stage. The early stage includes the stress fixation and resulting spontaneous vowel shifts, while the late stage is defined by ten complex rules governing changes of both vowels and consonants. By 250 BC Proto-Germanic had branched into five groups of Germanic, two each in the west and the north and one in the east. Phonological stages from Proto-Indo-European to end of Proto-Germanic The following changes are known or presumed to have occurred in the history of Proto-Germanic in the wider sense from the end of Proto-Indo-European up to the point that Proto-Germanic began to break into mutually unintelligible dialects. The changes are listed roughly in chronological order, with changes that operate on the outcome of earlier ones appearing later in the list. The stages distinguished and the changes associated with each stage rely heavily on Ring 2006, Chapter 3, The Development of Proto-Germanic. Ring in turn summarizes standard concepts and terminology. Topic. 
Pre-Proto-Germanic Pre-PGMC This stage began with the separation of a distinct speech, perhaps while it was still forming part of the Proto-Indo-European dialect continuum. It contained many innovations that were shared with other Indo-European branches to various degrees, probably through aerial contacts, and mutual intelligibility with other dialects would have remained for some time. It was nevertheless on its own path, whether dialect or language. Early Proto-Germanic This stage began its evolution as a dialect of Proto-Indo-European that had lost its laryngeals and had five long and six short vowels as well as one or two overlong vowels. The consonant system was still that of pi minus palatovelars and laryngeals, but the loss of syllabic resonance already made the language markedly different from pi proper. Mutual intelligibility might have still existed with other descendants of Pi, but it would have been strained, and the period marked the definitive break of Germanic from the other Indo-European languages and the beginning of Germanic proper, containing most of the sound changes that are now held to define this branch distinctively. This stage contained various consonant and vowel shifts, the loss of the contrastive accent inherited from Pi for a uniform accent on the first syllable of the word root, and the beginnings of the reduction of the resulting unstressed syllables. Late Proto-Germanic By this stage, Germanic had emerged as a distinctive branch and had undergone many of the sound changes that would make its later descendants recognizable as Germanic languages. It had shifted its consonant inventory from a system that was rich in plosives to one containing primarily fricatives, had lost the pi mobile pitch accent for a predictable stress accent, and had merged two of its vowels. The stress accent had already begun to cause the erosion of unstressed syllables, which would continue in its descendants. The final stage of the language included the remaining development until the breakup into dialects and, most notably, featured the development of nasal vowels and the start of umlaut, another characteristic Germanic feature. <laughs> Lexical evidence in other language varieties Loans into Proto-Germanic from other known languages or from Proto-Germanic into other languages can be dated relative to each other by which Germanic sound laws have acted on them. Since the dates of borrowings and sound laws are not precisely known, it is not possible to use loans to establish absolute or calendar chronology. <laughs> loans from adjoining Indo-European groups Most loans from Celtic appear to have been made before or during the Germanic sound shift. For instance, one specimen asterisk rix ruler was borrowed from Celtic asterisk rix king stem asterisk rig, with gk. It is clearly not native because pi asterisk ei is typical of not Germanic but Celtic languages. Another is asterisk walhas, foreigner, Celt, from the Celtic tribal name Volsi with kh and oa. Other likely Celtic loans include asterisk ambadas servant, asterisk brunjo male shirt, asterisk gislas hostage, asterisk isarna iron, asterisk lakias healer, asterisk lauda lead, asterisk rinas rhine, and asterisk tunas tuna fortified enclosure. These loans would likely have been borrowed during the Celtic Hallstatt and early Latinae cultures when the Celts dominated Central Europe, although the period spanned several centuries. From East Iranian came asterisk hanapis hemp, compare kotanesi kamha, Ossetian gan a flax, asterisk humilaz, humilo hops, compare osset zumaileg, asterisk kepo tilde skepa sheep, compare pers kapis yearling kid, asterisk kurtalaz tunic cf. Osset krat shirt, asterisk kuda cottage, compare pers kod house, asterisk pato cloak, asterisk paws path, compare avestan panta, gen. Patho, and asterisk worst what work compare avenue verstua. The words could have been transmitted directly by the Scythians from the Ukraine plain, groups of whom entered Central Europe via the Danube and created the Vekerzig culture in the Carpathian Basin 6th to 5th centuries BC, or by later contact with Sarmatians, who followed the same route. Unsure is asterisk marha's horse, which was either borrowed directly from Scytho-Sarmatian or through Celtic mediation. Topic. Loans into non-Germanic languages 
Numerous loanwords believed to have been borrowed from Proto-Germanic are known in the non-Germanic languages spoken in areas adjacent to the Germanic languages. The heaviest influence has been on the Finnic languages, which have received hundreds of Proto-Germanic or pre-Proto-Germanic loanwords. Well-known examples include PGMC asterisk Drutinas warlord compare Finnish Rutinas, asterisk Rangas later asterisk Haringas ring compare Finn Rangas, Estonian Rangas, asterisk Kuningas king compare Finn Kuningas, asterisk Lambas lamb compare Finn Lamas, asterisk Lunas ransom compare Finn Lunas. Loanwords into the Samic languages, Baltic languages and Slavic languages are also known. Non-Indo-European substrate elements The term substrate with reference to Proto-Germanic refers to lexical items and phonological elements that do not appear to be descended from Proto-Indo-European. The substrate theory postulates that the elements came from an earlier population that stayed amongst the Indo-Europeans and was influential enough to bring over some elements of its own language. The theory of a non-Indo-European substrate was first proposed by Sigmund Feist, who estimated that about a third of all Proto-Germanic lexical items came from the substrate. Theo Venman has hypothesized a Basque substrate and a Semitic superstrate in Germanic. However, his speculations too are generally rejected by specialists in the relevant fields. Research in Germanic etymology continues, and many Germanic words whose origins were previously unclear or controversial now have plausible explanations in terms of reconstructed indo european European words and morphology. Thus, the proportion of Germanic words without any plausible etymological explanation has decreased over time. Estimates of that proportion are typically outdated or inflated, as many of these proposals were unknown when scholars were compiling lists of unexplained Germanic words. <laughs> Phonology Topic. Transcription The following conventions are used in this article for transcribing Proto-Germanic reconstructed forms Voiced obstruents appear as b, d, g, this does not imply any particular analysis of the underlying phonemes as plosives, b, d, or fricatives, β. In other literature, they may be written as graphemes with a bar to produce, d, g. Unvoiced fricatives appear as f, h, perhaps, theta, x. x, may have become, h, in certain positions at a later stage of Proto-Germanic itself. Similarly for, x, which later became, h, or, in some environments. Labiovelars appear as kw, hw, gw, this does not imply any particular analysis as single sounds e.g., k, x, or clusters e.g., kw, xw, with. The yod sound appears as j, j. Note that the normal convention for representing this sound in Proto-Indo-European is y. The use of j does not imply any actual change in the pronunciation of the sound. Long vowels are denoted with a macron over the letter, e.g. o. When a distinction is necessary, and e, are transcribed as an e squared respectively. Is sometimes transcribed as a or a instead, but this is not followed here. Over long vowels appear with circumflexes, e.g. o. In other literature they are often denoted by a doubled macron, e.g. Nasal vowels are written here with an ogonic, following Don Ring's usage, e.g. o tilde. Most commonly in literature, they are denoted simply by a following n. However, this can cause confusion between a word final nasal vowel and a word final regular vowel followed by n, a distinction which was phonemic. Tildes a, i, u, are also used in some sources. Diphthongs appear as i, o, e, u, u, oi, o and perhaps a, u. However, when immediately followed by the corresponding semivowel, they appear as a, j, j, a, e, u, i, w, w, u is written as w when between a vowel and j. This convention is based on the usage in Ring 2006. Long vowels followed by a non-high vowel were separate syllables and are written as such here, except for i, which is written ij in that case. Topic: <laughs> <laughs> Consonants. The table below lists the consonantal phonemes of Proto-Germanic classified by their reconstructed pronunciation. 
The slashes around the phonemes are omitted for clarity. When two phonemes appear in the same box, the first of each pair is voiceless, the second is voiced. Phones written in parentheses represent allophones and are not independent phonemes. For descriptions of the sounds and definitions of the terms, follow the links on the headings. Notes Was an allophone of n, before velar obstruents. Was an allophone of n, before labiovelar obstruents. Beta and were allophones of b, d, and in certain positions see below. The phoneme written as f was probably still realized as a bilabial fricative, in Proto-Germanic. Evidence for this is the fact that in Gothic, word final b which medially represents a voiced fricative devoices to f and also Old Norse spellings such as aptr ter, where the letter p rather than the more usual f was used to denote the bilabial realization before, t. Grimm's and Werner's Law Grimm's Law is applied to pre-Proto-Germanic as a chain shift of the original Indo-European plosives. Werner's Law explains a category of exceptions to Grimm's Law, where a voiced fricative appears where Grimm's Law predicts a voiceless fricative. The discrepancy is conditioned by the placement of the original Indo-European word accent. P, T, and K did not undergo Grimm's law after a fricative such as S or after other plosives which were shifted to fricatives by the Germanic spirant law, for example, where Latin with the original T has stella, star, and octo, eight. Middle Dutch has stir and oct with unshifted T. This original T merged with the shifted T from the voiced consonant, that is, most of the instances of T came from either the original T or the shifted T. A similar shift on the consonant inventory of Proto-Germanic later generated High German. McMahon says, Grimm's and Werner's laws together form the first Germanic consonant shift. A second, and chronologically later second Germanic consonant shift affected only Proto-Germanic voiceless stops and split Germanic into two sets of dialects, Low German in the north and High German further south. Werner's law is usually reconstructed as following Grimm's law in time, and states that unvoiced fricatives, s, theta, x, are voiced when preceded by an unaccented syllable. The accent at the time of the change was the one inherited from Proto-Indo-European, which was free and could occur on any syllable. For example, pi asterisk b ray ter greater than p g m c. Asterisk brower. Brother. But pi asterisk me ter greater than pgmc. Asterisk motor. Mother. The voicing of some s, according to Werner's law produced, z, a new phoneme. Some time after Grimm's and Werner's law, Proto-Germanic lost its inherited contrastive accent, and all words became stressed on their root syllable. This was generally the first syllable unless a prefix was attached. The loss of the Proto-Indo-European contrastive accent got rid of the conditioning environment for the consonant alternations created by Werner's law. Without this conditioning environment, the cause of the alternation was no longer obvious to native speakers. The alternations that had started as mere phonetic variants of sounds became increasingly grammatical in nature, leading to the grammatical alternations of sounds known as grammatischer Wechsel. For a single word, the grammatical stem could display different consonants depending on its grammatical case or its tense. As a result of the complexity of this system, significant leveling of these sounds occurred throughout the Germanic period as well as in the later daughter languages. Already in Proto-Germanic, most alternations in nouns were leveled to have only one sound or the other consistently throughout all forms of a word, although some alternations were preserved, only to be leveled later in the daughters but differently in each one. Alternations in noun and verb endings were also leveled, usually in favor of the voiced alternants in nouns, but a split remained in verbs where unsuffixed strong verbs received the voiced alternants while suffixed weak verbs had the voiceless alternants. Alternation between the present and past of strong verbs remained common and was not leveled in Proto-Germanic, and survives up to the present day in some Germanic languages. Allophones. <laughs> <laughs> Some of the consonants that developed from the sound shifts are thought to have been pronounced in different ways allophones, depending on the sounds around them. With regard to original, k, or, k, trask says, 
the resulting x or x were reduced to h and h in word initial position many of the consonants listed in the table could appear lengthened or prolonged under some circumstances which is inferred from their appearing in some daughter languages as doubled letters this phenomenon is termed gemination Krahman says then proto-germanic already had long consonants but they contrasted with short ones only word medially Moreover, they were not very frequent and occurred only intervocally almost exclusively after short vowels. The voiced phonemes, b, d, and, are reconstructed with the pronunciation of stops in some environments and fricatives in others. The pattern of allophony is not completely clear, but generally is similar to the patterns of voiced obstruent allophones in languages such as Spanish. The voiced fricatives of Werner's law see above, which only occurred in non-word initial positions, merged with the fricative allophones of b, d, and. Older accounts tended to suggest that the sounds were originally fricatives and later hardened into stops in some circumstances. However, Ring notes that this belief was largely due to theory internal considerations of older phonological theories, and in modern theories it is equally possible that the allophony was present from the beginning. Each of the three voiced phonemes, b, d, and had a slightly different pattern of allophony from the others, but in general stops occurred in strong positions word initial and in clusters while fricatives occurred in weak positions post-vocalic. More specifically, Word initial, b, and, d, were stops, b, and, d. A good deal of evidence, however, indicates that word initial, was, subsequently developing to, in a number of languages. This is clearest from developments in Anglo-Frisian and other Ingvianic languages. Modern Dutch still preserves the sound of, in this position. Plosives appeared after homorganic nasal consonants, m, b, n, d. This was the only place where a voiced labiovelar could still occur. When geminate, they were pronounced as stops b -b -d -d. This rule continued to apply at least into the early West Germanic languages, since the West Germanic gemination produced geminated plosives from earlier voiced fricatives. D was d after l, or z. Evidence for d after r is conflicting, it appears as a plosive in Gothic ward. Word. Not asterisk war, with devoicing, but as a fricative in Old Norse or. D, hardened to D in all positions in the West Germanic languages. In other positions, fricatives occurred singly after vowels and diphthongs, and after non-nasal consonants in the case of B, and Labiovelars <laughs> 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 Numerous additional changes affected the labiovelar consonants. Even before the operation of Grimm's law, they were reduced to plain velars next to u, due to the Bocolo's rule of pi. This rule continued to operate as a surface filter, i.e. if a sound change generated a new environment in which a labiovelar occurred near a, u, it was immediately converted to a plain velar. This caused certain alternations in verb paradigms, such as asterisk singwana cn to sing versus asterisk sungun soon they sang. Apparently, this delabialization also occurred with labiovelars following un, showing that the language possessed a labial allophone as well. In this case, the entire clusters ux, uk, and ug are delabialized to ux, uk, and u. After the operation of Werner's law, various changes conspired to almost completely eliminate voiced labiovelars. Initially, became b, e, g. Pi asterisk g aid yeti greater than p g m c. Asterisk biddy asks for. The fricative variant which occurred in most non-initial environments usually became w, but sometimes instead turned into the only environment in which a voiced labiovelar remained was after a nasal, e.g. in asterisk singwana cn to sing. These various changes often led to complex alternations, e.g. asterisk sewana sex n to c, asterisk segan s un they saw indicative, asterisk seven s y n they saw subjunctive, which were reanalyzed and regularized differently in the various daughter languages.
Topic consonant gradation Krunen 2011 posits a process of consonant mutation for Proto-Germanic, under the name consonant gradation. This is distinct from the consonant mutation processes occurring in the neighboring Samic and Finnic languages, also known as consonant gradation since the 19th century. The Proto-Germanic consonant gradation is not directly attested in any of the Germanic dialects, but may nevertheless be reconstructed on the basis of certain dialectal discrepancies in root of the end stems and the on verbs. Diachronically, the rise of consonant gradation in Germanic can be explained by Kluge's law, by which geminates arose from stops followed by a nasal in a stressed syllable. Since this sound law only operated in part of the paradigms of the end stems and on verbs, it gave rise to an alternation of geminated and non-geminated consonants. However, there has been controversy about the validity of this law, with some linguists preferring to explain the development of geminate consonants with the idea of expressive gemination. The origin of the Germanic geminate consonants is currently a disputed part of historical linguistics with no clear consensus at present. The reconstruction of grading paradigms in Proto-Germanic explains root alternations such as Old English steora star. Topic: <laughs> Vowels. Proto-Germanic had 4 short vowels, 5 or 6 long vowels, and at least 1 overlong or trimaric vowel the exact phonetic quality of the vowels is uncertain notes e could not occur in unstressed syllables except before r where it may have been lowered to already in late proto-germanic times all nasal vowels except and occurred word finally the long nasal vowels and occurred before x and derived from earlier short vowels followed by slash and x slash dot pi a o merged into pgmca pi a o merged into pgmco at the time of the merger the vowels probably were and or perhaps and their timbers then differentiated by raising and perhaps rounding the long vowel to it is known that the raising of a to o cannot have occurred earlier than the earliest contact between proto-germanic speakers and the romans this can be verified by the fact that latin romani later emerges in gothic as rumones that is rumanus it is explained by Ring that at the time of borrowing, the vowel matching closest in sound to Latina was a Proto-Germanic-alike vowel, which later became O. And since Proto-Germanic therefore lacked a mid-high back vowel, the closest equivalent of Latin O was Proto-Germanic U, Romani greater than asterisk Rumanis greater than asterisk Rumanis greater than Gothic Rumwanes. A new O was formed following the shift from O to O when intervocalic J was lost in Asia sequences. It was a rare phoneme, and occurred only in a handful of words, the most notable being the verbs of the third week class. The agent noun suffix asterisk arias modern English er was likely borrowed from Latin around or shortly after this time. <laughs> <laughs> diphthongs The following diphthongs are known to have existed in Proto-Germanic Short, u, i, e, u, u Long, u, i, possibly, u, i, note the change, e, greater than, i, before, i, or, j, in the same or following syllable. This removed, a, which became, i, but created, u, from earlier, e, u. Diphthongs in Proto-Germanic can also be analyzed as sequences of a vowel plus an approximant, as was the case in Proto-Indo-European. This explains why, j, was not lost in asterisk nijaz, new. The second element of the diphthong U was still underlyingly a consonant and therefore the conditioning environment for the loss was not met. This is also confirmed by the fact that later in the West Germanic gemination, WJ is geminated to WWJ in parallel with the other consonants except R. Topic: <laughs> Overlong vowels. Proto-Germanic had two overlong or trimoric long vowels o and e, the latter mainly in adverbs cf. asterisk wadre where to, whither. None of the documented languages still include such vowels. Their reconstruction is due to the comparative method, particularly as a way of explaining an otherwise unpredictable two-way split of reconstructed long o in final syllables, which unexpectedly remained long in some morphemes but shows normal shortening in others. Trimoric vowels generally occurred at morpheme boundaries where a bimoric long vowel and a short vowel in hiatus contracted, especially after the loss of an intervening laryngeal VHV. 
One example, without a laryngeal, includes the class II weak verbs o stems where a j was lost between vowels, so that oya oa o cf. Asterisk salboyana asterisk salbona gothic salbon to anoint. However, the majority occurred in word final syllables inflectional endings probably because in this position the vowel could not be resyllabified. Additionally, Germanic, like Balto-Slavic, lengthened bimoric long vowels in absolute final position, perhaps to better conform to a word's prosodic template, e.g., pgmc asterisk arrow eagle pi asterisk h air on just as lith akmuo stone, osl kami asterisk akam pi asterisk h e acute mon. Contrast Contraction after loss of laryngeal, gen.pl, asterisk wolf, wolves. Asterisk wolf on pre GMC asterisk wolpum pi asterisk WK ohom, o stem nom dot PL. Asterisk os pre GMC asterisk os pi asterisk AS. Contraction of short vowels, a stem nom dot PL, asterisk wolf os, wolves, pi asterisk WK OES, but vowels that were lengthened by laryngeals did not become over long. Compare O stem nom dot sg, asterisk o asterisk a pi asterisk a O stem acc dot sg, asterisk o asterisk an asterisk am by Stang's law pi asterisk am O stem acc dot pl, asterisk os asterisk as asterisk as by Stang's law pi asterisk ans. Trimoric vowels are distinguished from bimoric vowels by their outcomes in attested Germanic languages. Word final trimoric vowels remained long vowels while bimoric vowels developed into short vowels. Older theories about the phenomenon claimed that long and overlong vowels were both long but differed in tone, i.e., O and E had a circumflex rise -fall -rise tone while O and E had an acute rising tone, much like the tones of modern Scandinavian languages, Baltic, and ancient Greek, and asserted that this distinction was inherited from Pi. However, this view was abandoned since languages in general do not combine distinctive intonations on unstressed syllables with contrastive stress and vowel length. Modern theories have reinterpreted overlong vowels as having super-heavy syllable weight three moras and therefore greater length than ordinary long vowels. By the end of the Proto-Germanic period, word-final long vowels were shortened to short vowels. Following that, overlong vowels were shortened to regular long vowels in all positions, merging with originally long vowels except word-finally because of the earlier shortening, so that they remained distinct in that position. This was a late dialectal development, because the end result was not the same in all Germanic languages, word final e shortened to a in East and West Germanic but to i in Old Norse, and word final o shortened to a in Gothic but to o, probably o in Early North and West Germanic, with a later raising to u the 6th century Salic law still has Maltho in Late Frankish. The shortened over long vowels in final position developed as regular long vowels from that point on, including the lowering of e to a in North and West Germanic. The monophthongization of unstressed O in Northwest Germanic produced a phoneme which merged with this new word final long O, while the monophthongization of unstressed I produced a new E which did not merge with original E, but rather with, as it was not lowered to A. This split, combined with the asymmetric development in West Germanic, with E lowering but O raising, points to an early difference in the articulation height of the two vowels that was not present in North Germanic. It could be seen as evidence that the lowering of e to a began in West Germanic at a time when final vowels were still long, and spread to North Germanic through the late Germanic dialect continuum, but only reaching the latter after the vowels had already been shortened. And is uncertain as a phoneme and only reconstructed from a small number of words, it is posited by the comparative method because whereas all provable instances of inherited pi asterisk e pgmc asterisk are distributed in Gothic as e and the other Germanic languages as asterisk a, all the Germanic languages agree on some occasions of e e.g., goth, o e, on her here late pgmc asterisk hr. Gothic makes no orthographic and therefore presumably no phonetic distinction between an, but the existence of two Proto-Germanic long E-like phonemes is supported by the existence of two E-like Elder Futhark runes, Awas and Awas. Crahi treats secondary e as identical with I. It probably continues pi A, and it may have been in the process of transition from a diphthong to a long simple vowel in the Proto-Germanic period. Lehman lists the following origins for 
A Old High German Fiara, Fera Ham, Goth Fera Side, Flank, PGMC Asterisk F Row Asterisk Pay S A Pi Asterisk S P E H I Aia, the preterite of class 7 strong verbs with i, al or an plus a consonant, or, e.g. ohg arian to plow asterisk aryanin versus preterite iar, ier asterisk er is, after loss of z, ung med, ohg miata, reward, versus ung mayord, goth misdo pgmc asterisk m do asterisk misdo pi asterisk misda. Certain pronominal forms, e.g. Ung her, ohg here, here, pgmc asterisk here, derivative of asterisk hi, this pi asterisk key, this. Words borrowed from Latin e or e in the root syllable after a certain period, older loans also show i. Topic nasal vowels Proto-Germanic developed nasal vowels from two sources. The earlier and much more frequent source was word final n from pi n or m in unstressed syllables, which at first gave rise to short a, i, u, long, and over long. And then merged into an, which later developed into o and. Another source, developing only in late Proto-Germanic times, was in the sequences i n h, n, u n h, in which the nasal consonant lost its occlusion and was converted into lengthening and nasalization of the preceding vowel, becoming h, h, h still written as an, i n h, u n h in this article. In many cases, the nasality was not contrastive and was merely present as an additional surface articulation. No Germanic language that preserves the word final vowels has their nasality preserved. Word final short nasal vowels do not show different reflexes compared to non nasal vowels. However, the comparative method does require a three way phonemic distinction between word final asterisk o, asterisk o, and asterisk on, which each has a distinct pattern of reflexes in the later Germanic languages. The distinct reflexes of nasal o versus non nasal o are caused by the Northwest Germanic raising of final o, to o, which did not affect o. When the vowels were shortened and denasalized, these two vowels no longer had the same place of articulation, and did not merge, o became, o, later, u, while o became, later. This allowed their reflexes to stay distinct. The nasality of word internal vowels from nh was more stable, and survived into the early dialects intact. Phonemic nasal vowels definitely occurred in Proto-Norse and Old Norse. They were preserved in Old Icelandic down to at least a.d. 1125, the earliest possible time for the creation of the first grammatical treatise, which documents nasal vowels. The PG nasal vowels from NH sequences were preserved in Old Icelandic as shown by examples given in the first grammatical treatise. For example, H A acute R shark raw younger younger versus ora vex goose similar surface possibly phonemic nasal non nasal contrasts occurred in the West Germanic languages down through Proto Anglo Frisian of A D 400 or so. Proto Germanic medial nasal vowels were inherited, but were joined by new nasal vowels resulting from the Ingvianic nasal spirant law, which extended the loss of nasal consonants only before H in Proto Germanic to all environments before a fricative, thus including MF, N, and NS as well. The contrast between nasal and non nasal long vowels is reflected in the differing output of nasalized long asterisk, which was raised to O in Old English and Old Frisian, whereas non nasal asterisk O appeared as fronted A. Hence, English goose, West Frisian goes, North Frisian goose n tooth n brought, wfris brought. Topic: <laughs> Phonotactics. Proto-Germanic allowed the following clusters in initial and medial position: non-dental obstruent plus l, place, kl, Florida, hl, sl, bl, gl, wl. Obstruent plus R, PR, TR, KR, FR, R, OUR, BR, DOCTOR, GR, WR Non-labial obstruent plus W, TW, DW, KW, W, HW, SW Velar plus nasal, S plus nasal, KN, HN, SM, SNIT allowed the following clusters in medial position only TL Liquid plus W, LW, RW Geminates, pp, tt, kk, ss, bb, dd, gg, m, nn, ll, rr, jj, ww. 
consonant plus j, p j, t j, k j, f j, j, h j, z j, b j, d j, g j, m j, n j, l j, r j, w j i t allowed the following clusters in medial and final position only fricative plus obstruent, feet, h t, f s, h s, z d Nasal plus obstruent, MP, MF, MIS, MB, NT, NK, N, NH, NS, ND, ING however NH was simplified to H, with nasalization and lengthening of the previous vowel, in late Proto-Germanic L plus consonant, LP, LT, LK, LF, L, LH, LS, LB, LD, LG, LM R plus consonant, RP, RT, RK, RF, R, RH, RS, RB, Road, RG, ERM, RNTHES plus voiceless plosive clusters, SP, Street, SK, could appear in any position in a word. Topic later developments Due to the emergence of a word initial stress accent, vowels in unstressed syllables were gradually reduced over time, beginning at the very end of the Proto-Germanic period and continuing into the history of the various dialects. Already in Proto-Germanic, word final, e, and, had been lost, and, e, had merged with, i, in unstressed syllables. Vowels in third syllables were also generally lost before dialect diversification began, such as final i of some present tense verb endings, and in ma's and mis of the dative plural ending and first person plural present of verbs. Word final short nasal vowels were however preserved longer, as is reflected Proto-Norse which still preserved word final a horna on the gallus horns, while the dative plural appears as mz gestums on the stentofen runestone. Somewhat greater reduction is found in Gothic, which lost all final syllable short vowels except U. Old High German and Old English initially preserved unstressed I and U, but later lost them in long-stemmed words and then Old High German lost them in many short-stemmed ones as well, by analogy. Old English shows indirect evidence that word final A was preserved into the separate history of the language. This can be seen in the infinitive ending an asterisk n, but asterisk n is greater than asterisk i ni greater than asterisk n. Therefore, the Anglo-Frisian brightening must necessarily have occurred very early in the history of the Anglo-Frisian languages, before the loss of final a. The outcome of final vowels and combinations in the various daughters is shown in the table below. Note that some Proto-Germanic endings have merged in all of the literary languages but are still distinct in runic Proto-Norse, e.g. Asterisk is versus asterisk ejaz rehas dotras three daughters in the tune stone versus the name holtias in the gallus horns. Topic <laughs> morphology. Reconstructions are tentative and multiple versions with varying degrees of difference exist. All reconstructed forms are marked with an asterisk asterisk. It is often asserted that the Germanic languages have a highly reduced system of inflections as compared with Greek, Latin, or Sanskrit. Although this is true to some extent, it is probably due more to the late time of attestation of Germanic than to any inherent simplicity of the Germanic languages. As an example, there are less than 500 years between the Gothic Gospels of 360 and the Old High Germantation of 830, yet Old High German, despite being the most archaic of the West Germanic languages, is missing a large number of archaic features present in Gothic, including dual and passive markings on verbs, reduplication in class 7 strong verb past tenses, the vocative case, and second position clitics. Many more archaic features may have been lost between the Proto-Germanic of 200 BC or so and the attested Gothic language. Furthermore, Proto-Romance and Middle Indic of the 4th century AD—contemporaneous with Gothic—were significantly simpler than Latin and Sanskrit, respectively, and overall probably no more archaic than Gothic. In addition, some parts of the inflectional systems of Greek, Latin, and Sanskrit were innovations that were not present in Proto-Indo-European. General morphological features Proto-Germanic had six cases, three genders, three numbers, three moods indicative, subjunctive, pi-optative, imperative, and two voices active and passive pi-middle. This is quite similar to the state of Latin, Greek, and Middle Indic of c. AD 200. Nouns and adjectives were declined in at least six cases, vocative, nominative, accusative, dative, instrumental, genitive. 
The locative case had merged into the dative case, and the ablative may have merged with either the genitive, dative or instrumental cases. However, sparse remnants of the earlier locative and ablative cases are visible in a few pronominal and adverbial forms. Pronouns were declined similarly, although without a separate vocative form. The instrumental and vocative can be reconstructed only in the singular, the instrumental survives only in the West Germanic languages, and the vocative only in Gothic. Verbs and pronouns had three numbers, singular, dual, and plural. Although the pronominal dual survived into all the oldest languages, the verbal dual survived only into Gothic, and the presumed nominal and adjectival dual forms were lost before the oldest records. As in the Italic languages, it may have been lost before Proto-Germanic became a different branch at all. Topic consonant and vowel alternations Several sound changes occurred in the history of Proto-Germanic that were triggered only in some environments but not in others. Some of these were grammaticalized while others were still triggered by phonetic rules and were partially allophonic or surface filters. Probably the most far-reaching alternation was between asterisk f, asterisk Asterisk s, asterisk h, asterisk h w, and asterisk b, asterisk d, asterisk z, asterisk g, asterisk g w, the voiceless and voiced fricatives, known as grammatischer Wechsel and triggered by the earlier operation of Werner's law. It was found in various environments, in the person and number endings of verbs, which were voiceless in weak verbs and voiced in strong verbs. Between different grades of strong verbs. The voiceless alternants appeared in the present and past singular indicative, the voiced alternants in the remaining past tense forms. Between strong verbs voiceless and causative verbs derived from them voiced. Between verbs and derived nouns. Between the singular and plural forms of some nouns, another form of alternation was triggered by the Germanic spirant law, which continued to operate into the separate history of the individual daughter languages. It is found in environments with suffixal t, including, the second person singular past ending asterisk t of strong verbs. The past tense of weak verbs with no vowel infix in the past tense. Nouns derived from verbs by means of the suffixes asterisk tis, asterisk tus, asterisk tas, which also possessed variants in and d when not following an obstruent. An alternation not triggered by sound change was Seaver's law, which caused alternation of suffixal j and ij depending on the length of the preceding part of the morpheme. If preceded within the same morpheme by only short vowel followed by a single consonant, j appeared. In all other cases, such as when preceded by a long vowel or diphthong, by two or more consonants, or by more than one syllable, ij appeared. The distinction between morphemes and words is important here, as the alternate j appeared also in words that contained a distinct suffix that in turn contained j in its second syllable. A notable example was the verb suffix asterisk adiana, which retained j despite being preceded by two syllables in a fully formed word. Related to the above was the alternation between j and i, and likewise between i j and i. This was caused by the earlier loss of j before i, and appeared whenever an ending was attached to a verb or noun with an i j suffix which were numerous. Similar, but much more rare, was an alternation between avenue and aic from the loss of j between two vowels, which appeared in the present subjunctive of verbs. Asterisk oi mutation was the most important source of vowel alternation, and continued well into the history of the individual daughter languages, although it was either absent or not apparent in Gothic. In Proto Germanic, only e was affected, which was raised by i or j in the following syllable. Examples are numerous, verb endings beginning with I, present second and third person singular, third person plural. Noun endings beginning with I in U stem nouns, dative singular, nominative and genitive plural. Causatives derived from strong verbs with a J suffix. Verbs derived from nouns with a J suffix. Nouns derived from verbs with a J suffix. Nouns and adjectives derived with a variety of suffixes including il, io, iskas, ingas. Topic. Nouns The system of nominal declensions was largely inherited from pi. Primary nominal declensions were the stems in a, o, n, i, and u. The first three were particularly important and served as the basis of adjectival declension. There was a tendency for nouns of all other classes to be drawn into them. The first two had variants in ya, and wa, and jo, and wo, respectively. Originally, these were declined exactly like other nouns of the respective class, but later sound changes tended to distinguish these variants as their own subclasses. 
The n nouns had various subclasses, including on, masculine and feminine, and neuter, and in, feminine, mostly abstract nouns. There was also a smaller class of root nouns ending in various consonants, nouns of relationship ending in er, and neuter nouns in z. This class was greatly expanded in German. Present participles, and a few nouns, ended in nd. The neuter nouns of all classes differed from the masculines and feminines in their nominative and accusative endings, which were alike. Adjectives Adjectives agree with the noun they qualify in case, number, and gender. Adjectives evolved into strong and weak declensions, originally with indefinite and definite meaning, respectively. As a result of its definite meaning, the weak form came to be used in the daughter languages in conjunction with demonstratives and definite articles. The terms, strong, and weak, are based on the later development of these declensions in languages such as German and Old English, where the strong declensions have more distinct endings. In the proto-language, as in Gothic, such terms have no relevance. The strong declension was based on a combination of the nominal a uh, and o uh, stems with the pi pronominal endings. The weak declension was based on the nominal n declension. Topic: <laughs> Determiners. Proto-Germanic originally had two demonstratives, proximal asterisk hi this, distal asterisk sa, sa, at that, which could serve as both adjectives and pronouns, although the proximal was obsolescent in Gothic, e.g. Goth acc. Hina, dat. Hima, newt. Hida, and obsolete everywhere else. Ultimately, only the distal survived, evolved into the definite article, and underlies the English determiners the and that. In the Northwest Germanic languages, but not in Gothic, a new proximal demonstrative this as opposed to that evolved by appending C to the distal demonstrative, e.g. Runic Norse nom. Sg, sa C, gen. Sc, dat. I'm C, with complex subsequent developments in the various daughter languages. The new demonstrative underlies the English determiners this, these and those, originally, these, those were dialectal variants of the masculine plural of this. Topic. Verbs Proto-Germanic had only two tenses past and present, compared to five to seven in Greek, Latin, Proto-Slavic and Sanskrit. Some of this difference is due to deflection, featured by a loss of tenses present in Proto-Indo-European. For example, Donald Ring assumes for Proto-Germanic an early loss of the pi imperfect aspect something that also occurred in most other branches, followed by merging of the aspectual categories present aorist and the mood categories indicative subjunctive. This assumption allows him to account for cases where Proto-Germanic has present indicative verb forms that look like pi aorist subjunctives. However, many of the tenses of the other languages e.g. future, future perfect, pluperfect, Latin imperfect are not cognate with each other and represent separate innovations in each language. For example, the Greek future uses s ending, apparently derived from a desiderative construction that in pi was part of the system of derivational morphology not the inflectional system, the Sanskrit future uses a psi ending, from a different desiderative verb construction and often with a different oblaut grade from Greek, while the Latin future uses endings derived either from the pi subjunctive or from the pi verb asterisk, bu, to be. Similarly, the Latin imperfect and pluperfect stem from italic innovations and are not cognate with the corresponding Greek or Sanskrit forms, and while the Greek and Sanskrit pluperfect tenses appear cognate, there are no parallels in any other Indo-European languages, leading to the conclusion that this tense is either a shared Greek-Sanskrit innovation or separate, coincidental developments in the two languages. In this respect, Proto-Germanic can be said to be characterized by the failure to innovate new synthetic tenses as much as the loss of existing tenses. Later Germanic languages did innovate new tenses, derived through periphrastic constructions, with modern English likely possessing the most elaborated tense system. Yes, the house will still be being built a month from now. On the other hand, even the past tense was later lost, or widely lost, in most High German dialects as well as in Afrikaans. Verbs in Proto-Germanic were divided into two main groups, called strong and weak, according to the way the past tense is formed. 
Strong verbs use oblaut i.e. a different vowel in the stem and or reduplication derived primarily from the Proto-Indo-European perfect, while weak verbs use a dental suffix now generally held to be a reflex of the reduplicated imperfect of pi asterisk dheh1 originally put in Germanic do. Strong verbs were divided into seven main classes while weak verbs were divided into five main classes although no attested language has more than four classes of weak verbs. Strong verbs generally have no suffix in the present tense, although some have a j suffix that is a direct continuation of the pi y suffix, and a few have an n suffix or infix that continues the n infix of pi. Almost all weak verbs have a present tense suffix, which varies from class to class. An additional small, but very important, group of verbs formed their present tense from the pi perfect and their past tense like weak verbs, for this reason, they are known as preterite present verbs. All three of the previously mentioned groups of verbs strong, weak, and preterite present are derived from pi thematic verbs, an additional very small group derives from pi athematic verbs, and one verb asterisk wilhana to want forms its present indicative from the pi optative mood. Proto Germanic verbs have three moods indicative, subjunctive, and imperative. The subjunctive mood derives from the pi optative mood. Indicative and subjunctive moods are fully conjugated throughout the present and past, while the imperative mood existed only in the present tense and lacked first-person forms. Proto-Germanic verbs have two voices, active and passive, the latter deriving from the pi medio passive voice. The Proto-Germanic passive existed only in the present tense an inherited feature, as the pi perfect had no medio passive. On the evidence of Gothic—the only Germanic language with a reflex of the Proto-Germanic passive, the passive voice had a significantly reduced inflectional system, with a single form used for all persons of the dual and plural. Note that, although Old Norse like modern Faroese and Icelandic has an inflected mediopassive, it is not inherited from Proto-Germanic, but is an innovation formed by attaching the reflexive pronoun to the active voice. Although most Proto-Germanic strong verbs are formed directly from a verbal root, weak verbs are generally derived from an existing noun, verb or adjective so-called denominal, diverbal and dejectival verbs. For example, a significant subclass of class I weak verbs are diverbal causative verbs. These are formed in a way that reflects a direct inheritance from the pi causative class of verbs. Pi causatives were formed by adding an accented suffix a, e, a, o to the o grade of a non derived verb. In Proto Germanic, causatives are formed by adding a suffix j, i, j, the reflex of pi a, e, a, o to the past tense oblaut, mostly with the reflex of pi o grade of a strong verb, the reflex of pi non derived verbs, with Werner's law voicing applied, the reflex of the pi accent on the a, e, a, o suffix. Examples Asterisk batana, class 1 to bite asterisk beta jana to bridle yoke restrain ie to make bite down asterisk rasana class 1 to rise asterisk rasajana to raise ie to cause to rise asterisk bugana class 2 to bend asterisk bagajana to bend transitive asterisk brinana class 3 to burn asterisk branajana to burn transitive asterisk frauerana class 3 to perish asterisk frawardajana to destroy ie to cause to perish asterisk nasana class 5 to survive asterisk naziana to save ie to cause to survive asterisk ligjana class 5 to lie down asterisk lagiana to lay ie to cause to lie down. Asterisk Farana, class six. To travel, go. Asterisk Forajana. To lead, bring. I.e. To cause to go. Asterisk Farjana. To carry across. I.e. To cause to travel. An archaic instance of the O grade oblaut used despite the differing past tense oblaut. Asterisk Gretana, class seven. To weep. Asterisk Grotajana. To cause to weep. Asterisk Lais, class one, preterite present. S he knows. Asterisk Lazajana. To teach. I.e. To cause to know. As in other Indo-European languages, a verb in Proto-Germanic could have a proverb attached to it, modifying its meaning, cf. e.g. asterisk fra warana, to perish, derived from asterisk warana, 
to become. In Proto-Germanic, the proverb was still a clitic that could be separated from the verb as also in Gothic, as shown by the behavior of second position clitics, e.g. dis a and sat, and then he seized, with clitics a, and, and an, then, interpolated into dis sat, he seized, rather than a bound morpheme that is permanently attached to the verb. At least in Gothic, proverbs could also be stacked one on top of the other similar to Sanskrit, different from Latin, e.g. ga ga wirgen, to reconcile. An example verb, asterisk nemina, to take, class 4 strong verb. Topic. Pronouns One unstressed variant Schleicher's pie fable rendered into Proto-Germanic August Schleicher wrote a fable in the pie language he had just reconstructed, which though it has been updated a few times by others still bears his name. Below is a rendering of this fable into Proto-Germanic, the first is a direct phonetic evolution of the pie text. It does not take into account various idiomatic and grammatical shifts that occurred over the period. For example, the original text uses the imperfect tense, which disappeared in Proto-Germanic. The second version takes these differences into account, and is therefore closer to the language the Germanic people would have actually spoken. Proto-Germanic, phonetic evolution from pi only Asterisk awiz awaz a, awiz, he si wulo ne est, spi awans, aina kuru waga wegandu, aina a miko bura, aina a gamanu ahu burandu. A whiz nu awamas wiuhi, hurt anutai mech, witandi awans a kandu gamanu. Awas wiuha, haludi, awi, hurt anutai uns witandamas, gumo, fadis, wulo aja wernuti sibi warma westra. Aja a wulo ne isti. At heluaz a whiz akra buki, proto Germanic, with contemporary grammar and vocabulary. Asterisk awiz awaz a, awiz, sawulo ne habda, sahw awans, inano kurjano wagna toihandu, inano a mikilo curio, inano a gamanu sniamundo barandu. Awiz nu awamas saj, herda seri mek, sewand awans a kandu gamanu. Awaz sagdedan, gahazi, awi, herda seri uns sewandumis, gumo, fadis, uz awiz wulo worki sis warm awastio. Awiz a wulo ne habai. At Hausaitas a whiz Acra Flau, English The sheep and the horses, a sheep that had no wool saw horses, one pulling a heavy wagon, one carrying a big load, and one carrying a man quickly. The sheep said to the horses, My heart pains me, seeing a man driving horses. The horses said, Listen, sheep, our hearts pain us when we see this, a man, the master, makes the wool of the sheep into a warm garment for himself. And the sheep has no wool. Having heard this, the sheep fled into the plain. See also Pre-Indo-European disambiguation Holtzmann's Law Subi Notes <laughs>